really going to dive into using social media today, but mainly Twitter, since I feel like that's where most of us are, are used to using a uh, platform. Today, we also have Tim Hamrick and Woody Van Arkle joining us through Zoom. My name is Tim Hamrich. I'm here in beautiful Eagle, Idaho. Uh, I'm a communications consultant for a company called Cogent Consulting and um, do a, uh, a couple of podcasts for, for both myself and for clients. Abby and I do the Soil Sense podcast uh, together and just excited to be here. Good morning, Woody. Can you introduce yourself? Woody, or I think it shows up as Laurent every once in a while, but uh, <laughs> I'm a farmer in uh, southwestern Ontario and uh, I've had the fortune of getting to meet uh, some very interesting people in North Dakota over the last six years. We're going to talk about using Twitter from both a consultant, uh, which would be Tim, the farmer perspective of Woody, a researcher and Kaylee's use, and then also uh, extension perspective. So, so let's get right into it with Twitter. Um, we're going to kind of go around and share about why each of us use Twitter and, and what's the biggest gain that we get out of our social media involvement. So Tim, let's start with you. Um, how does Twitter help you in your line of work and your consulting business? Well, yeah, I, I actually, I got on Twitter early in, in 2008, and then I just had like a dormant account for a long time. I mean, like seven years where I barely ever used it. I didn't quite understand it. What finally clicked with me is that it's, it's a really unique way to organize the world's conversations in a way that you have access to it. So it's easy to kind of jump in and out of the conversations you want to have. And before that, I thought, oh, it's just a place to post things and nobody follows me. So why would I post things there? And so when I finally figured out, it's like, oh, it's access to any conversation that exists pretty much on the planet that I want to be involved with. I can just go hop in and have that conversation. And so uh, as I started to kind of narrow my focus, which is really on sort of agricultural innovation, I found conversations that were happening on ag innovation and just started uh, asking questions, engaging, uh, retweeting, sharing things. And since then it's grown into a more broader, just uh, conversations that are happening about cool things in agriculture. Um, and it really has been rewarding, especially in this past year of times of isolation, places to just kind of get plugged in and get connected and, and part of the conversation. Yeah, that's great. Um, definitely a great place to feel connected to the greater world outside of our immediate vicinity. So Woody, Woody how about you? How, how does Twitter help you as a farmer? Uh, I just went back and looked and I signed up in 2012 um, because everybody said you should sign up for Twitter. Um, it was slow, slow to start, but I soon realized that if I started to post some of the stuff that I'm doing um, at home on the farm, uh, it was a great way to start a discussion about what I was doing and, and uh, you know, if I had a question about something, there's always somebody out there that could kind of answer that question. So it was, uh, uh, it's been a great way to share information for me. Yeah, well, that's... Um... People like you are one of the reasons why I personally uh, am on Twitter. So I like to follow a lot of farmers and other people in ag industries, crop advisors, um, even some kind of agronomy and, and agricultural retailers just to kind of keep tabs on what's happening in agriculture because it seems like a lot of the current developments and innovation is it, it always makes its way to Twitter. So that's um, that's one of the reasons that I use it as a researcher, just to kind of keep in touch with the practitioners and what they're doing and what questions they have and what kind of conversations they're having. Um, but I also, as a researcher, use it for, um, I follow a ton of other scientists, um, much like in the agricultural world, in the scientific world, if there's a new innovation, a new paper published, a new finding, I usually see it on Twitter before I see it anywhere else. And so it's a great place for me to kind of streamline all of that information and um, kind of just go to one place to see the latest and greatest um, and connect with those other scientists. Um, I also follow a lot of other educators. And so there are lots of um, excellent educators at other universities or all over the world. And they're sharing their innovations in teaching and, um, and what, they're, what they're doing in their classrooms, sharing the work of their outstanding students. And that's always really inspiring. Um, and then I also use it to kind of share what we're doing on the research end and highlight some of the work of my fantastic students and colleagues at NDSU and um, it's, you know, I'm probably more of a browser and consumer than I am a poster. Um, I could probably work on that, but uh, I do find that it's great to, a great place to kind of streamline all of that, as Tim said, and go to one spot to get it all um, in, a, in a really efficient way. So what about you, Abby? 
Oh, you know, I, I started using it when I realized that I was texting farmers, you know, groups of farmers or individual farmers, a lot of photos of what I was seeing in the field. And after a while that got overwhelming and people are like, stop filling up my text, <laughs> text messages on my phone because it, you know, just, it got overwhelming. And so I actually had talked with Daryl Richardson, who's our, our state climatologist here at NDSU. And he's like, Abby, you need to be on Twitter. And I was so reluctant. And he's like, no, no, look what you can do. You can follow all of these different ag magazines. You can get all this information. I, I started following researchers like Kaylee because I, I was feeling like my like my finger was off the pulse of, of what was happening in research, and especially in soils or soil health or ecology or or anything really. And um, and so that's kind of what got me on Twitter. And it and it also became a great way to document what I was doing every day for my annual report. <laughs> so uh, oftentimes, if you ask my technician where I am, they'll look back at my Twitter account. They'll say, oh yeah, she's down in Morton today at the share farm. And, and uh, so it's been a great way for people to kind of know where I am and, and to kind of keep tabs on that. But, um, you know, I think... I think I've made a lot of connections too. And I've really valued those, like, like Kaylee was saying, you know, following different farmers and consultants and ag retailers and, and so making some of those connections. And I certainly would never have, have crossed paths with Woody um, probably, or with Tim uh, if I wasn't on Twitter. So I, it, this is one way to show how those connections actually can turn into something very productive, whether it's the Ontario farmers uh, coming to North Dakota several times to, to look at our fields, to be part of meetings, or in Tim's case, you know, coming here and doing the Soil Sense podcast, and then that turns into the Field Check podcast, and then that incur you know, turns into co-hosting things like the Dirt Workshop and the Communication Workshop in December. So a lot of really great relationships can be formed on Twitter, and that's, that's probably the major, you know, the biggest benefit I've gotten out of it. Um, but let's go into a few logistics about this, because we realize that not everybody who's tuned in today, either you may not have a Twitter account already, or if you do, you kind of feel like it's in hibernation, like Tim was talking about, where it's just kind of there, but you're not excited about it. Um, so Tim, I'm going to put up this next PowerPoint slide, and maybe you could talk us through like just some of the logistics of setting up an account and what you need to include. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, from hearing uh, everyone to talk about their why, another concept popped into my mind that I use it extensively for, which is kind of workshopping ideas, you know, whereas if you're going to write a blog post, uh, or in my case, do a podcast, you know, you kind of want to have the idea somewhat developed. But Twitter, you can kind of throw something out there and see, you know, what people respond with. And it's a great way to sort of enhance ideas. So anyway, I just wanted to add that on there. But let's get to the to the basics here. The slide you're looking at is just a really, really basic profile of Twitter. Um, you know, I think for me, the way I would look at this is like if somebody followed me and I looked at their profile and I'm trying to decide like whether I want to follow them back, some things that I'm going to look for. And for sure, a picture, if you don't have a picture on there, it used to default to like an egg. I'm not sure if it still does that. But like if, if you're just an egg, you want to just put something up there that shows a picture and a little bit of context about you. You know, if I'm looking at someone I might want to follow, I want to know kind of what context am I looking at this in? In Abby's case, obviously, you've got her name and what she does, soil health, and then a little bit more background on her. Um, location is helpful. Some people don't feel comfortable listing their location. I don't think it's mandatory. Mine says out west, I think is all it says. Uh, but that I don't think that's mandatory. But you definitely want picture, name, and a little bit of context. Uh, in there. It, I would say everything else there is probably optional, whether you have a banner image or not, whether you have, you know, website, birthday, all that's pretty optional. But I would definitely say you, you want, um, you know, your name as you'd like it presented and a little bit of context and a picture so that you're not an egg. Um, but it's really that simple. I mean, it may take it may take you one minute to, to get set up if you're not set up yet, uh, but but that's really it. And then the next thing I would say you wanna do, and maybe we're getting into this, so hopefully I'm not getting ahead of us, is just um, look for some interesting people that you wanna follow and engage with, uh, rather than trying to think of like, how do I get followers right away? Just like figure out a way to kind of invite yourself into a conversation because that's why people are tweeting. I'm gonna use that phrase, let's not be an egg. <laughs> Don't so, be an Tim, egg. I love that. <laughs> I might have to change my profile picture to an egg just to see what that feels like. Um, but, you know, I think what we'll do is, you know, you did a great job talking, like setting it up and how it should look. And maybe we'll go through each of our profiles just so people can learn something different from how each of us have posted. So as an extension person, you can see my banner has one of the, the programs that I've been offering this winter to kind of draw attention to that. Um, I chose my profile picture to be in front of corn. I wanted to show a connection to agriculture. And because corn is a tall crop, I'm already a tall person. So it wouldn't make me look <laughs> funny if I was squatting down in a wheat field or hiding somewhere. Um, so that's why I use that, that corn picture. Um, I do think it's important to keep that picture current. If you don't look like that anymore, then you probably need to change your picture or find something that does reflect, reflect you if somebody were to meet you in person. 
Um, I also included, I used to be just Abby Wick and I actually put the doctor in front of my name um, just recently because I worked really hard for that. And I was always trying to be more relatable and not have it. But then I thought, you know what? I worked hard for that and I'm going to put it on my profile. And then I got a lot of people congratulating me on my, my dissertation defense <laughs> and becoming a PhD. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. It started a new conversation. And I was like, well, that was really like 10 years ago. But, um, but that was kind of a fun thing to put on there. And then my handle is at NDSU Soil Health. And so I wanted it to be something easy to remember. Uh, most people, when they spell my name, they forget the E in Abby. So if I did NDSU Soil Health, I would be easier to find. Um, so that's why I included that part. In my profile description, I have a hashtag in there. So if people are searching Soil Health, they will come across my profile. Um, I put you know, an, a, an accomplishment that I'm really proud of, that National Committee uh, for Soil Science through the National Academy of Sciences, and then learning alongside farmers, because that's what's important to me. And then I also posted that I was on Instagram as well, in case people wanted to find me there. Um, I, the webpage I included was the, the Soil Health webpage for NDSU, and I wanted to make sure if people wanted more information that they could go there and, and find that information. Uh, what about you, Kaylee? What's, on, what's the reason behind your profile information? Yeah, so um, I also tried to include a, a current photo of myself that, um, that expresses my love for soil. So I have a sticker on my hat there that, that says I love soil. And then um, I try to always have like a engaging banner picture too, just because I think, you know, people enjoy seeing various uh, landscapes or pictures of the field. In this case, this is my version of a manicure. <laughs> Um, maybe not the most appetizing photo now that I think of it, but, um, anyway, it very much reflects, uh, who I am always trying to have my hands in the, in the soil. So, um, I definitely ag agree about those, those photos are uh, really helpful when you kind of see someone new follows you or pops into your, uh, mentions about, you know, comments on something, you know, it's nice to just kind of see what they're about and a photo really helps with that. Um, I also kind of just put my affiliation. Um, in my bio, I just want people to know that I'm, you know, I'm there, I'm here on Twitter to be, you know, re representing science and, um, and the science of soil health and soil ecology. I list a few things that I kind of study or my areas of interest in terms of research. Um, and I added a little kind of quote, um, I'm not the most you know, I tend to kind of gravitate more towards anti-social forms of media. And so I sort of have this like internal battle of, you know, how much time I want to spend on social media and engaging with other people versus um, sort of just sitting back and, and reflecting and having kind of thoughtful um, development in my own mind of, of soil health and reflection. So um, as much as I get out of Twitter, I try to walk the balance for, you know, keep a healthy relationship with, with Twitter. And so that's, uh, that's where that, um, that little quote comes from. That's sort of what I, uh, not, not a whole lot of strategy behind the development of my profile, but um, hopefully it represents who I am. Um, so uh, what about you, Woody? Tell us about setting up your profile and, and the, the things that you like to include. If anybody knows me really well, they know I have a goofy side or silly side. Um, so my Twitter world seems to slide between uh, what I'm doing on the farm or my serious side and then some silly stuff. Sometimes I think I should put up two Twitter accounts, one for, for each, but uh, it's always evolving a little bit, I guess. The last thing I did was add those little pictures of what happens and what I like. But, Including um, beer, Woody. I see that on yours. Here's beer. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't. I got to find one for whiskey. I've started to like that too. <laughs> um, description there is, I guess, what I am, um, what I like to do, and then I, I always I put in there off, almost right off the beginning, um, uh, borrowing the soil from our children. That's part of a quote that I heard, and I think it describes a lot of what I do on my farm and why I do it. And then, of course, I finish that off with just something silly like born on a Tuesday. The banner or, or the pictures, they float, change, um, depending on what I feel like. Probably in the spring, something growing will show up up there. So it's always kind of changing a little. Nice. And Tim, what's on your profile? Yeah, my, um, mine looks a little bit different today than it did when the screenshot was taken. But uh, Kaylee mentioned kind of having a healthy relationship with Twitter. 
And uh, I, uh, I sometimes cross that line of an unhealthy relationship with Twitter. So I just cut myself off for large periods of time. In this case, uh, the entire month of January, I spent off of Twitter. So uh, when Abby asked me about this, I said, I don't know that I'm the best person to do this panel because I'm not even on Twitter right now. So, you know, occasionally I'll just do this, put something like starting 2021 offline and just, um, just not log on for a month. Um, I do that for a number of reasons, mostly because Twitter becomes my default when I have like five seconds of, you know, nothing stimulating my mind. I just automatically start scrolling Twitter and I try to just kind of break that habit a little bit. Um, so anyway, you know, the background image is my, uh, my podcast that uh, often I'm, I'm talking about topics related to my podcast on Twitter. So I have that up there. Uh, my picture uh, got my wife on there. So it pretties up my profile a little bit. And, um, and then, yeah, I mean, the, the rest is kind of pretty, pretty straightforward. I don't, I don't dwell too much on the, on the profile. Uh, but I, I, I don't like the thought of like someone tweeting me and thinking that I'm ignoring them. So that's why I kind of make it clear that I'm just uh, offline for, for a month, but I'm back on as of yesterday, as of the 1st of February uh, for, for an extended period of time until I cross that unhealthy boundary again and <laughs> cut myself off again, I guess. Well, it's nice. I usually notice when you do cut yourself off, Tim, you, you put in something in your, your title up there so that people can see that you're not actively on Twitter. So they don't tag you or they don't pester you or they don't wonder what happened to you. Um, you've told them, I'm, I'm just not on Twitter this month. And, and that brings up another question on, you know, how long do each of us spend on Twitter a day? And this is in the Q and A. And so Tim, maybe it's not the best time to ask you this question, but, but typically how long do you spend on Twitter per day? Yeah, it's, it's really tough to gauge because, um, uh, you know, because it's, it's kind of like a, like I said, it becomes kind of a default that I just kind of scroll and check. I would say maybe a, a, a more objective way I can answer that question is, is, you know, how often do I tweet? You know, I will, I will reply, uh, you know, to, to anybody who asks me a question or has a tweet that I think, you know, prompts a response specifically to me, I'll reply, um, you know, I'll, I'll retweet. And then usually, you know, usually I, I won't tweet more than as far as like a tweet from me once or twice a day. So if I was going to add it up, I would probably say, and I, I could check my iPhone after this month, because I don't know what last month was, you know, I wasn't on last month, but, um, you know, for me, probably an hour a day, um, but that's not like a block of time that I just sit there, you know, on Twitter, but it's probably accumulation of checking it, you know, a dozen or so times throughout the day is probably a ballpark for me. Yeah, Kaylee, how about you? You're teaching, you're doing research, you're doing all those things. How often are you on Twitter? And do you have it on your phone even? I don't. I, um, I don't have it on any of my portable devices. So I only uh, typically use Twitter by logging in um, from my computer. And I, I don't spend a, a whole lot of time on it because I do have, you know, days are full as it is, but I do use it like when I, as a filler, kind of like uh, Tim said, if you have some idle time. And so maybe while I'm eating lunch or um, waiting for the next meeting and I have five or 10 minutes, I'll kind of scroll through. I'm also kind of an impatient person. And so um, I can maybe only stand to um, kind of scroll through for about five minutes and then I kind of get antsy and I, I need to move on. Um, and so I can kind of catch up uh, multiple times throughout the day, maybe three or four times, but um, I restrict my my Twitter use uh, quite a bit based on which devices I I reach for easily. I spend too much time on it, especially according to my son this morning. <laughs> so I'm actually going to put some restrictions on myself because I, I will have my phone by me, you know, when I get home, and I am going to start um, not doing anything on Twitter until I drop my son off at school, and then I'm once I get home at night, I'm not going to do anything else on Twitter either. And I'm and that goes the same for text messages, emails, all that. I just need to create a boundary between my professional career, my work career and, and my personal life. And, um, you know, and that gets to this, this question that came up in the Q and A on how do you balance personal and professional in your engagement? And so Woody, I, for you as a farmer, it's a little bit different because your personal life is your professional life in a lot of cases on the farm. And, and do you, do you have an issue balancing that? Or do you, do you try to balance those two things? Um, right now, I probably spend way too much time on Twitter, but it's winter. Uh, I don't feel like wandering outside on a cold, damp day or something. Then I find myself scrolling through it. Um, I always have my Sunday mornings. Uh, I find you can get into some really interesting uh, discussions on Sunday mornings for some reason. And uh, so Sunday mornings tend to be a little busy for me. Uh, when, I, when I start farming or get busy outside, it's usually um, you know, first thing in the morning while I'm eating breakfast because I'm up 
by myself usually at that point. And uh, later on in the evenings, the odd time through the middle of the day, but not often when I'm busy. Uh, one thing though, when planting and auto steer, sometimes you do creep into it on, in your tractor on the about middle of the afternoon. But uh, um, I, I try to, uh, I don't go off for a month like Tim does, but I will, I'll have days, two or three days in a row where I will just ignore it. Uh, every once in a while, if I tend, if I get overloaded or, uh, yeah, just sometimes I just get tired of it a little bit and I'll, I'll take two or three days off. Yeah, that's great advice. Just take a little break whenever you can. And, um, you know, I, I think we, there's a comment in the chat of, you know, the doom scroll is a scary place <laughs> and, and it really is. And sometimes I get caught in that scroll and I keep looking at it, looking, and finally I just tap, you can actually tap that bottom left icon and it will just get you to the top. And sometimes that's a really good tool where if you, if you get caught in the scrolling and you're like, well, I'm only halfway through this, you know, the content and you can actually just tap the button on the bottom and it just pushes you right to the top. And then you don't even know what you missed, which is totally fine um, in a lot of cases. So, um, oh, and then you can, they, they say, then you can start scrolling all over again. That's true. And there've been times too, where I've, where I've run out of content on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I'm like, oh, what else am I going to look at while I'm waiting? And then I, I realize that's a really unhealthy place to be. So, uh, so shifting away from that. But, but if you do have content that you want people to see, using this, this approach of a pinned tweet is a really good idea. And so I'm gonna bring up um, how you set that for your profile. And so you see up here, um, and I can't remember how I got to this slide, but I think you can click on the bottom right hand um, corner of a tweet, and, and then you can click pin to your profile. And basically what that's gonna do is push, you, push that, that tweet up to the top of your profile. And people are gonna see it first thing when they see your, your Twitter account. And so oftentimes changing that pinned tweet to get your message across and have that most important message is, is, the, is a great way to do it. Um, so we can run through what each of us have for our pinned tweets. Uh, mine has since changed. I usually change it every day or every couple of days just because we have new content coming out all the time. Um, so in mine, I, and this would be a great opportunity too to talk through how to, to navigate some of these, the, the tweets that you put out there to get them to be something people can find, um, that they could search for, that can tag other people and get you more followers or to bring awareness to your tweets. So um, in mine, I think it's a, a pretty decent example of using hashtags. So I've got hashtag soil, soil health and then hashtag tailgate talk, which are kind of the two uh, things that we're promoting now. Um, but if you, if you do a hashtag soil health, that means that if somebody goes into the search function on Twitter and they type in soil health, they can find all the tweets that have that hashtag in it. Um, so that can be a really good way to get your information found. Uh, this particular video I posted was with Joe Brecker. So he has a Twitter account and I tagged him in it because I want him to know it's there and to be able to retweet it. Um, you can see another hashtag in there. And then I include a link and that's to the actual video. And so oftentimes when using Twitter, especially an extension, if you are posting some content, you obviously have very minimal space to do that. But if you provide that link to the next set of content, if somebody's really curious, they can go find more information. And so that's how I use it typically is to, as kind of a teaser and something that's searchable in my tweet, but then also here's the link for more information. You can watch the full 15 minute video here. So uh, that's kind of how I use it. And that's what I put as my pinned tweet. And, and Kaylee, you've got a really interesting picture for somebody if they're not in soils might wonder what that is. <laughs> Uh, I need to work on my pictures on Twitter, huh? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so my pinned tweet is a little old now. This is from World Soil Day in 2019. So December 5th every year is a day that we call World Soil Day. It's just like a, a, a day to appreciate and express your love for soil. And so... Um, so I tweeted a picture that's a close up of a, of a plant root that has some soil aggregates uh, kind of bound and interacting with those plant root hairs and probably some other all kinds of other good beneficial microbes. Um, and I just like anything microscopic and I have a little microscope attachment camera for my iPhone. And so I, I think I took this photo um, probably out in the field somewhere and um, you know, I think about soil at a very small scale. And so, uh, so that was my photo that I, I wanted to share for that World Soil Day. And um, again, you can kind of um, add those hashtags for maybe specific events or um, the communication workshop. And, um, and then you can even just, you know, people scrolling through can click on that hashtag and then um, 
th that'll take them to an entire page just full of, of tweets that include that specific hashtag. So for example, on World Soil Health or on World Soil Day, you can click on that and see everyone else's love for soil um, and just kind of celebrate um, all the beautiful pictures of soil on there. So, um, and having a picture like that, I mean, that really stops yeah, yeah. you in your scroll. Like I'm curious now. Yeah. <laughs> and, this is. and that's a good tip. I think for anyone in general is that, um, most tweets that have photos are going to catch a lot more attention. Just it's eye catching, you know, as humans where we like color and shape and that kind of thing. And so, um, so having a photo is, you know, attached to every tweet or or some kind of a graphic item or or link to a video or something is definitely a great idea. Um, so one good question is if there's a place in a, a tweet that's best to place the hashtag. You know, I think oftentimes the, the hashtags can be nestled within a sentence really well, like in the example of Abby's pin tweet. Um, and so you kind of embed those hashtags just in the sentence along with the words that you would use in a sentence. Other times you can kind of add them to the end of, you know, maybe you, you have a, a, some, some narrative or some text that explains your tweet, you know, the, the bulk of the tweet, but then you still want to hashtag that tweet. And so you just add a bunch of hashtags at the end. And I think both of those ways are effective. I think so. You have, to, you have to take caution. When you start using hashtags with words clumped together like that in your tweets, all of a sudden you'll be writing a magazine article and you start putting <laughs> hashtags throughout the article. <laughs> and so it's, it's a word of caution as you start doing that. But, uh, you know, how about you, Woody? What, uh, let's look at your pinned tweet and what that looks like. Yeah, I, I put this up because a lot of stuff I put on Twitter mm -hmm. is, um, say, a little bit out there as far as farming goes. It's not exactly a proven practice. And I just want somebody if they're checking me out or, or my profile that they read that you know, this is what I'm doing and I want to just make sure that I'm not misleading anybody that I still want to uh, have everybody understand that I'm working with uh, researchers or wherever I can or to validate some of this but it's a lot of what I'm doing can't really be validated yet so uh, that's why I put this up there just to make sure that anybody that's looking at what I'm doing knows that where I'm at. It changes a little bit every once in a while. I'll ponder the thought and I'll, I'll put a different one up there, but it's, this one's been there for probably a year or so, I think. Yeah, that's a good one. Then you can see also too that, that underneath that tweet is, is a show this thread. And that means that if you click on that, you're going to see the seven different comments that Woody has gotten uh, in response to this tweet. And that's also interesting too, to look at that thread of information as well. And, and Tim, you've got, you know, another, you've got a different pin tweet for yours that I would love to know how you get those spaces in there because I've never figured that out. But but what's on your pin tweet? Oh, it, it's it's just like you'd put a space anywhere else. It's just an enter, uh, I think. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah. So mine's a thread as well, and I think threads are kind of an interesting concept with Twitter. I've seen people that maybe write papers or do podcasts elsewhere that will summarize it in in a series of tweets uh, called a thread, which I think that's interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, number one, you know, every time you add to the thread, it kind of uh, boosts the conversation up in people's timelines, but also because you can see how people respond to various aspects of the idea. So maybe there's one of the, there's a thread of, oh, sorry, I got my kids leaving for school downstairs. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, maybe you've got uh, seven ideas in a thread and you see that, you know, idea number four, people are retweeting, liking, commenting, creating discussion, like that can give you some really good feedback that you wouldn't get from a blog post that maybe someone just shares. And so anyway, um, I like threads, uh, although I don't use them as maybe often as, as I could, uh, but in this case, it's my pinned tweet because it was kind of a culmination of, of uh, work that I'd done last year. Nice, well, I, I feel not like the smartest person knowing you just hit an enter button and you get a space in there. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to try that nifty trick, Tim, <laughs> to bring, bring attention to my tweets. Um, uh, so we, we've got this great question here, too, from the Q&A. And keep those questions coming, because right now we've, we've gone through kind of the content we're going to go through on Twitter to set the stage. And so we want to answer your questions now on, on how, to, how to navigate the system and what's best, best for you. Um, so here's a question in the Q&A on, on why should people familiar with Facebook start on Twitter? What's better or worse? And I personally don't have a Facebook account. I don't know, Kaylee, if you have Facebook, um, Tim or Woody do, neither of you have Facebook. So clearly we're all Twitter fans, but Tim, you had a Facebook page, I remember, and, and you've since kind of switched to Twitter and what are the benefits or what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I'm a believer in, in, for myself at least, um, 
focusing in on platforms that that, that work for me. And so uh, I used to have Facebook. I used to have Instagram. Um, I have since you know gotten out of those because Twitter and LinkedIn just work better for me. I just got Clubhouse this week, and so I'm going to try it out. And if it works for me, you know, great. I might continue to use it, but but uh, or I might not. You know, I don't use social media so much for broadcasting information. Um, I find other more long form. Um, platforms to be better for that. Um, I really use it to engage. And so I don't feel like I can keep up with engaging with so many different platforms. But if Facebook's working great for you, by all means, you know, uh, use that, you know, Facebook groups can be very, uh, very powerful for for engagement. What I was finding, though, is whenever I post from my own pr profile on Facebook, or from my company page on Facebook, the engagement just kind of wasn't there. I mean, I might get likes, and, um, you know, shares, but uh, there, there wasn't really a conversation happening. And that's sort of what I was looking for. Um, so uh, for me, I decided to focus in on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I'll try some of these other platforms and see if they work. But uh, I don't, I don't want to have a dozen platforms I have to keep up with. I just can't even imagine. I mean, I told you I spend probably an hour on Twitter. If I had, you know, four other ones like it, I wouldn't get anything done today. I have five hours of you know, social media time. So I, I try to focus in on where I get that engagement, because that's what enriches me most. So you're not looking to be an influencer, Tim? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> nobody's nobody is looking for me to be an influencer, including myself. <laughs> oh boy. So okay, so gaining followers, that's the next good question. Yeah, yeah. And I um I think we should I definitely want to hear your take on this, Abby, because you uh, you've certainly generated a very faithful and broad following on Twitter. It's uh it's pretty amazing. So um I want to hear your take, but I think for me, I've, I've sort of, um, it's not something that I've consciously worked on. Um, you know, I think if I were to look at the, the list of people that I follow versus my followers, they would probably be fairly different communities. And that's just because, um, you know, I kind of direct a lot of my tweets towards more of the practitioners. Um, and that just kind of generates, you know, they'll, they'll start liking the tweets and then their friends or followers will see that. And so, so for me, it's been, um, I haven't been strategic about building a following. Um, I think it's just that, you know, people find interesting content. And, um, and so I, like I said, most of my followers have been through the practitioners, whereas most of my following is through a, a lot more of the science, um, other scientists and researchers. So, um, so I, I can't speak about a specific strategy, but it, it, even if you don't try, I guess is my point is that it will, it will happen if you continue to post and engage with, um, with content that, you know, people are interested in. So how about you, Abby? What's the, what's the trick? Oh, I, you know, I, I got my starting on Twitter because somebody that had a lot of followers, Daryl Richardson, the one who is actually not on Twitter anymore. <laughs> he had, he had posted that I was on Twitter and because he had a lot of farmers following him, when he posted that I was on Twitter now and had a new account, that's what gave me a lot of followers right off the bat. Um, I've, I've been, I used to think that I had to get for every post, every tweet I had that I, I should gain one follower. And so I was trying to keep that number pretty even on the number of tweets and then the number of followers. And that's really overwhelming and stressful. So don't do that. That's a terrible idea. Um, but now I just, I just look to, I look at the, the tweets that I do have that, that are you know, gaining followers and, and what the, what the content is of those tweets and how can I continue to post that kind of content? I don't try to manipulate the information I share to gain followers, but if there are things that I'm sharing, whether it's my own vulnerability on Twitter, whether it's, it's what it's like to be an extension specialist and that gains more followers from the extension world, whether it's um, some cool things we're doing with, with farmers and the on-farm work or the researchers that research that we're involved with, I try to make sure I post that information. Um, you know, but in posting about your vulnerability that can create some negativity, which is not always fun to deal with. And, and Woody, I'm going to ask this question to you. And how do you, how do you gracefully exit from that negativity that you might get on Twitter? And, uh, sorry, this is a hot one for a question, but, but we're going to give it to you first. Well, I was going to answer the question about followers. I, I really don't care. I just post stuff <laughs> and, and look for the conversation. So, um. I check every once in a while out of curiosity, but uh, yeah, the negative stuff. I used to fall down some rabbit holes and, and get into debates and arguments and um, there's healthy debates and then there's ones that are just going go nowhere and I've just stopped replying. Um, and the, usually if it gets to that point, that might be one of those times I take a couple of days off. 
where I just stay away from Twitter for a day or two. Tim, how about you? What do you what's your strategy for for dealing with some of that stuff? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Woody shared some wisdom there. I don't know that I have a strategy, but I think you have to sort of remind yourself that I think I think what starts to creep into your mind is like, oh wow. Uh, they're making, you know, they're making me look bad. And if I don't respond, then everyone's just going to be on their side. You know, there might be like a sort of a little part, emotional part of you that wants to think that. And, and that's not rational. That's not true. If somebody's being a troll online, everybody can see they're being a troll. And other trolls might, you know, like their tweet or retweet them. But they just have this little troll community that does things like that. Sorry, I'm this is probably not very politically correct here. But anyway, I think you, you have to remember that, um, you know, people can see the negativity and the aggression. And if there is, to Woody's point, if it, if it can be a productive conversation, even if they're not handling it very well, that, then great, you know, engage with that. But if, if it's they're just looking for attention from you in a negative way, um, just move on and, and everybody will, will see it for what it is. If, if I could add to that, it, I come to the conclusion you don't need to answer every tweet that's, um, that's sent to you. So if, if it's not productive or it doesn't look like it's uh, going to be in your favor or something that you want to get into, just, I just ignore it. Somebody sends me stuff. That's all great advice. And I think um, not only can other everyone see who the trolls are, but keep in mind that they can see your responses as well. And so, you know, there's always those moments where you, you know what you want to say, but then you, <laughs> you kind of have to filter yourself and realize like this is a public platform and, you know, I'm, you want to come across as a professional. I think we all do, um, especially in this context of, you know, sharing agriculture information and, um, and I think, you know, uh, I would commend you, Woody, especially because I think you've definitely, uh, you, you have a very positive presence on Twitter. I really admire the way that you navigate some difficult kind of situations and, um, and, and kind of keep the, the tone very positive and, and uplifting and, you know, remind people that we're here to share information in a, in a healthy way. So, um, so yeah, those, that would be my sage advice is either ignore them or, you know, respectfully respond, but then duck out when uh, it comes to the point where it's not worth your effort and time anymore. So I'm going to put up this next PowerPoint slide because this one helps you handle these situations <laughs> and what you can do to remove yourself from it. And, um, you know, here's, here's, here's your toolbox for getting out of these conversations. If you're tired of it, you can unfollow somebody. Um, typically an extension I don't unfollow unless I find their content very, very offensive, um, but I will mute them because I just don't want to hear it anymore. So you have the option to mute whoever you want on Twitter and they don't even know you muted them. And you can just, you can go ahead and do that. You can save yourself the heartache and the, the stress of, of seeing what they're posting. And um, you know, that's, that's something you can do. I, I see on, on, on the chat now, somebody said, don't unfollow Jim. And this, I put Jim up there because, because <laughs> this conversation with Jim, he was actually being really positive. I didn't want to put somebody negative up there that I did unfollow. <laughs> <laughs> that would open a whole can of worms or mute, sorry. Um, but you can also mute the conversation. And so if you're getting a bunch of tweets back and forth and you're, you're tagged in something and it's blowing up your, your Twitter and it's just, it's not something you want to be part of anymore, you can mute the conversation. Uh, and lastly, if you find that somebody is very offensive or their content is offensive or you feel threatened by them following you, uh, you can always block them. And I've done that quite a few times uh, for different situations where I felt like either the content they were posting was not something I believed in, um, whether it was political or you know, whatever. I mean, in times of, of politics, sometimes you do need to just you know, separate yourself from that. Uh, so blocking is another tool you can use. I've never used the report tweet because I'm not sure what that does or where it goes or how that affects people. So I don't use that one, but uh, those are certainly tools that you can use and are, are very effective for keeping you happy on Twitter mm -hmm. <laughs> and away from some of the garbage that may come around or the trolls. So, um, so use those tools that are available. And how do you evaluate your impact over social media? So um, this is a good question because um, at least for us up here, you know, from a university, we're kind of always having to defend our jobs in a way. Um, you know, we're working for the stakeholders, the, the taxpayers of North Dakota and um, and the way that they measure our, um, our success at our job is through impact. And that could mean a lot of things, but um, I think, you know, Abby's a great example of how, um, how Twitter can be a tool, social media in general can be a tool to reach 
uh, a really large audience. And then it also, you know, has, um, it's a, it's a piece of software. So there are analytic tools attached to Twitter. And so every single tweet, you know, Twitter keeps track of how many engagements and then um, how many times people follow up on the hashtags that you post or engage with your media or uh, go visit your profile and how many followers you get. Um, and so all of those um, analytical tools are really good at kind of helping us track sort of which tweets are getting traffic and which aren't. Um, and I think in a way that kind of speaks to um, the impact of the content that we're all posting. And so, um, so within your Twitter profile, you can go into the settings and, and even for each individual tweet, you can kind of check on your analytics to kind of gauge your impact and see, um, see the engagement with your tweets over time. Um, do you have anything else to add about that? Um, you know, just if, if you are reporting some of those things for, um, for if you're an extension or you're in research, there's typically not a place on your annual report or your, your promotion and tenure packet to do this. So create that space because this is important and it's not necessarily being recognized as an important way to, to reach other people or to share information, but it is. And especially now it's very important. Um, so I think I think that just, just making sure that you do follow some of those analytics and putting that information and, and giving yourself a pat on the back for social media because it does matter and it is important uh, to be engaged on those platforms. Um, you know, one of the things that came up here is, uh, is another question on, does somebody see if you unfollow them? Um, I'm sure I get unfollowed all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I actually see it. I see the number go down sometimes, but I don't know that I can figure out who unfollowed me. I don't know, Tim, do you know if, if people can find that out or? I don't think they can. Um, I don't think they can. I did, I did want to, uh, I did want to add, add one thing. Uh, well, they will see if, if you block them and then they look at your profile, they will see that you, that you have blocked them, but unfollow, they won't see on the analytics. Um, everything Kaylee said is, is right. And, and definitely that's what you have to do to kind of show that impact, but don't overlook the power of one individual connection. I mean, just the individual connection of, you know, me, connecting with Abby on Twitter and, and, you know, everything that's followed. And, and as she said at the top, you know, Woody, the connections there, like one individual connection on Twitter that can lead to a, a big impact somewhere else offline is something that really, really is important. And I don't know how you quantify that for, you know, for your job, for your work, but that's, that to me is where kind of a lot of the power comes from. Uh, but to your unfollow question, no, they won't know that you unfollowed them unless they go look at your profile and see that, you're not following them anymore and they happen to remember that you used to be following them. Yeah, so I, I just wanna add um, to, to what Tim just said about sort of that impact and the, um, the connections that you make on Twitter as sort of a measurement of, of the impact. And, and that kind of goes along with the uh, comment in the chat here about just because you have engagements doesn't necessarily mean that there's a lot of follow through and those people consuming, you know, they're not necessarily changing their behavior um, based on, you know, just viewing a tweet. Um, but certainly there are lots of examples of, um, you know, us having conversations um, or, you know, like, um, like people have already mentioned, they might pose a question or kind of workshop an idea. And I'm always kind of putting some ideas out like, hey, um, you know, what, what do you guys think about this? Or if, I'm, if, I, if I want a field to study this, uh, what are some ideas? And I think just that, that discussion, have, being able to have those conversations with people from all over and build those connections and that ultimately kind of, for me, they kind of trickle down into um, then developing a project and then I get grant funding and then I can fund a student and train a student and then we get some publications out of it. And so certainly I've, I've walked away from Twitter with those kinds of ideas. And, and for me, that's a huge impact uh, for my work and the, the kinds of things that we, we've been able to do. Um, it's just a great idea, a place to exchange ideas and, and develop those connections, like Tim said, and they can, they can become very fruitful in many different ways. How about for you, Woody? What's a major connection you've made or, or a new idea that's been brought to your farm through Twitter? Well, there's one little connection. Um, what was that that North Dakota thing that you come up with, Abby? Um, <laughs> it led to the point where we now, I think, officially adopted Lee Breeze out of that. Uh, there's, I'm a, <laughs> that's been, that's been an interesting ride, that one. Um, I'm always picking up little ideas. I'm, I'm kind of a junk collector of ideas, I guess, and I stick them in the back of my mind and somewhere down the road, they'll get used. So that's, I also tend to follow, um, I focus on who I follow more so than on who's following me. 
I like to find smart people or smarter than me people so I can maybe learn something by osmosis. Uh, um, as far as tweets go and, and evaluating, um, if I'm tweeting how, what the quality of my tweets is, I usually, I tend to see something that has a, uh, a nice thread attached to it or discussion that comes out of it. I, I see that as a good quality tweet and that's kind of what I'm, I'm trying to do. Start a discussion lots of times and it's in that discussion that uh, I tend to learn things. Sometimes, you know, at least in my experience, sometimes I'll tweet something and think that it might spur a discussion or get some, some interaction and then uh, it doesn't. And then other times, you know, something that something random that I decide to tweet on the fly kind of gets a lot of attention. And so what are um, some of your tips, Woody, for um, creating engaging content and kind of like developing those tweets that get that sort of spur those discussions that you're looking for? Do you have some tips about that? I usually, um, I was gonna say I aim for seven o'clock in the evening. Six to seven is a good time to tweet to get uh, attention uh, Sunday mornings, like I mentioned earlier. But I usually try to get something that's um, relevant to the farm and what I'm trying to do. And, and lots of times that'll spur on a, a pretty good conversation. We're getting another question here on creating groups within Twitter like you can in Facebook. And I, I think I've tried at this and, and failed at it miserably. So Tim, do you know anything about creating groups on Twitter? And not groups, but maybe they mean lists. Uh, lists can be very effective. So we talked about doom scrolling and uh, you know just kind of whatever the algorithm wants to put on your timeline, you get sucked into that. A good way to avoid that and a good way to not get bogged down by Twitter is to create a list. So you could create a soil health list, let's say, and all the people that you think are tweeting interesting thing about soil health, put them on a list. And then instead of looking at your timeline, you just click on that list and only their tweets will show up for you. And so it's a great way to like, especially in times where there's a lot of political chatter going on. I, I use these, I have one, uh, one list that's only ag journalists. And so if I wanna know news, what's happening in ag, I will click on that list and see what they're tweeting about. Cause they're always tweeting you know, their, their own stuff, which is great, which is what I'm looking for. So um, if by groups they mean lists, it's very, very effective. In fact, I know of some people going to following zero people, so they're not tempted by the timeline, and instead only putting people on a list because you don't have to follow them to put them on one of your lists um, so that you can keep up with, you know, maybe you want to have a, I'm a Steelers fan, so I want to have a Steelers fans list, and you want to have a soil health list and a podcaster list, and then I just click on those as I want specific content. Um, so there's a question about public or private lists. So a private list means you're the only one that knows that list exists. But a public list, uh, for example, my ag journalist list is public. If, if you want to go follow a list of ag journalists, you just go to my list in my profile and click follow ag journalists. Um, so you could use both. I know of, uh, I, I, I have both. In fact, I have a private list that's for kind of leads for stories for me that I just keep myself. And then I have public lists like the Ag Journalist one, but it's a really effective tool. Good. I'm going to go follow all your lists, Tim. <laughs> because it seems like it'd be really helpful instead of me trying to, trying to sort through what I have <laughs> to make something out of it. Gosh. Um, so um, uh, we had a, um, comment in the in the chat too it's a really good uh idea for building engaging comment and maybe spur a discussion with a survey and so you can do a little poll function um within your tweets and maybe ask a a question that you want people to ponder and comment on and that that uh is good at spurring discussion and i would also recommend just google some social media tips you know there are um good, there's really good advice out there on the interweb about, um, you know, how to craft engaging content, whether it's, you know, including photos or how to um, pick the correct hashtags or, um, or that kind of thing. And so, uh, so I think we all kind of just learn by doing. And, and like I said, you kind of hone your, uh, hone in on the things that sort of catch more attention than others. And you kind of learn as you go sort of what your audience is wanting. Um, but then also just kind of browse out there just some um, news articles or recommendations and guidelines for for developing engaging social media content and i think that's that's a good place to, to start too yeah that's such great advice because i just posted something on the uh, com workshop nd webpage uh, we actually have some tips on there on how to use 
so daily social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. I think I put Pinterest on there maybe too. You can, you can click on some of those documents we put together. Those are things that, uh, that, that Tim reviewed, the people I work with that, that are an advertising company, they've reviewed to kind of throw some tips in there and ideas. So uh, if you go to ND, uh, what, what is my webpage? Comworkshopnd.com. That sounds so weird. Comworkshopnd.com. If you go to that webpage, you'll see some of these different PDFs that are posted there. So if you want to print them out and, and get some of these tips and ideas in a printed format, you can you can get them there too. So let's just go around and uh, make sure that we kind of have a, a we each have a, an op opportunity to say a final thing about Twitter, um, words of wisdom, uh, tips and tricks, and and any kind of reflections. Let's uh, let's start with you, Woody. Words of wisdom. Hmm, they're hard to come by <laughs> for me sometimes. <laughs> Um, so one thing is, is avoid or ignore the, the rabbit holes and the things like that. Uh, I've just started to play with lists, like Tim said, and that's helped a lot. I've also muted, I guess, keywords. You can mute words that uh, filter tweets out of your stream. Uh, that's helped a lot. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, I, I tend to put up a lot of pictures. Um, that seems to spur conversation or attract people to it. Uh, videos tend to be a pain if you don't have great internet to upload. I struggle with that. Uh, I think the key takeaway though is to, to start interacting. Uh, find something that interests you and reply to it or ask a question. And uh, that starts building those connections and, and networks on Twitter. It's, uh, if you're just scrolling through and, and not interacting it's it's not going to be the same it's it's building them connections that uh, has been the best tool for me to to use twitter and got to meet people in north dakota because of it uh, i've connected with people in iowa pennsylvania australia um, europe all over so uh, it's it's putting the effort into to communicate back to to people on Twitter too. That that's a big key, I think. That's great. How about you, Tim? Final words, thoughts? Why the best thing I can do is just echo what Woody just said. I mean, and he's a great example of it, which is engage authentically. You know, bring bring yourself to the table. And if you want to, if you want to start a great discussion on Twitter, have it be a, a real question that you're genuinely curious about and, and kind of pro tip. If, if, it, if there's some element to it that also allows people to kind of brag on themselves a little bit, uh, people are always looking for you to open the door to kind of say, hey, you know, for example, what, you know, what's the best thing you ever done on your farm or for your farm business, right? So there's an element there where I'm, I'm kind of bragging, but you asked for it, right? So, I mean, there's a, there's like a little tactical tool there, but, uh, but engage authentically first and foremost. One other thing I'm going to bring up, uh, brand new to Twitter is, and I just saw this yesterday, is they are allowing you to start a newsletter on Twitter. So it's it, it, if you go uh, to your profile, you'll see it even has a little new icon next to it. It's Twitter plus review, which I guess is some newsletter company. So there might be, it's an email newsletter that you could start via Twitter. I don't know how this is going to work. I haven't messed with it at all, but that's also something that could be really interesting for those of you who also want to do some sort of email newsletter uh, to check that out. Abby, final words, thoughts? <laughs> Oh gosh, I, I think uh, I think if you're an extension, being on Twitter is a very good place to be, especially if you're working in agriculture. Um, you can certainly create connections that you may not have have created before. You can open up opportunities to bring in new information from outside of what you know in your state or your area. Um, making those connections for your farmers. So, for example, I know that farmers in North Dakota are benefiting greatly from the connection I have with Ontario, and also the connections I've helped them build with Ontario farmers and, and also communicators. So I know that that's benefiting them. I've seen it, I've seen it happen with, with practices we're using, with the way we're communicating um, and it's exciting. And so creating that opportunity for the people you work with is, is one benefit. And, and then also to say that, that when you're posting content, um, I kind of follow this 80-20 rule. So 80% of it is, is really professional. It's the, the meat of it, the information that people need to hear. And then the 20% is the personal side of it. So. For example, if I'm saying, you know, go to the, you know, uh, log on to the dirt workshop in December or whatever, I would have said, join me at the dirt workshop this December. Um, 
And, and by just saying, join me, it creates a whole personal element to that tweet that, that is going to make people want to be there because they want to, they want to hear your information. They want to spend time with you on uh, this virtual format. They want to come see you at this meeting um, to hear what you have to say. And so that 80, 20 rule can be a really good, good way to do it. I don't tweet a lot of pictures about my family or, or my son or anything like that. I, I try to leave that out of it because I know most people are following me for soul health information, not for uh, what my kid did today. But if I see something that relates to a community aspect that I that I find relates really well to soil health, or something that that kind of spurs discussion in soil health. I will post those things, uh, but never never really pictures of his face. Sorry, people, if you wonder what my kid looks like, you're just not going to see his face, <laughs> but you'll see him doing something cool. Uh, but that's kind of kind of what I do. And and Kaylee, anything else for you for ideas? No, I just uh, all really great advice and excellent people to follow to kind of learn the ropes of Twitter um, and see how how they how, get ideas for engaging. Um, and I, I just want to, you know, throw out the reminder that you're in control of your own Twitter destiny. You know, you hold the you're you're in the driver's seat. And so it's OK to recognize if um, if it's become an unhealthy habit or if you're engaging with um, shady characters and and just uh, know that it's okay to set up those boundaries and it should be a place where you can go to to get good information in a healthy way so um, just don't forget that you have complete control over your Twitter account and activity and and what it uh, what it communicates mm -hmm.